Well, good Shut evening up. to Somerset County and Cape May County. Um, we're glad that you are all participating in this uh, great workshop on garlic tonight. We hope you really enjoyed that, that wonderful video. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Over here we have Tom Horton, and he's our Rutgers specialist and going to talk about the production of garlic. In the center, you probably recognize Jeff Tober, our farmer uh, who uh, grows here in Burlington County. Uh, lots of different things, but tonight he's going to talk about everything he's learned about garlic, learning by doing, right? And then we have Ian Keith from uh, Rutgers Dining Services, and he's going to talk more about the buyer end um, and desires for, for garlic. So I hope you've got your questions ready. We're going to do our best to repeat all the questions that we get from the alternate sites. Um, and um, I'm sure your site coordinators are going to use that chat box to keep in communication with us. Um, so thanks again, and I look forward to the discussion. So I don't see the chat box. So do we have any questions from this room? Sure. Um, talk about how much garlic do you plant uh, a season and about how long into that, what, what's your yield on something like that and then how long do you keep that, can you store that for your CSA members or for sale throughout uh, you know, the rest of the year? Right. Um, so the, the question is, uh, how much are you planting for the yield that you're getting? And then um, how are you storing it? And how long uh, is that storage uh, taking place for in terms of having a marketable garlic? Right, great. Um, so this year, we're going to plant about 300 to 350 pounds of garlic. Uh, that field that you saw in the video was about um, four tenths of an acre, maybe between four tenths and half an acre. And um, so we'll, we'll plant 300, let's say 300 pounds. Um, and the yield we get will probably be, um, for, for hard neck garlic, you can expect maybe anywhere from four to seven times what you plant, depending on the year. We've had some bad garlic years and some better ones. This year was really good. I think we actually got maybe eight to one yield uh, this year. So, um, so that 300 pounds that we plant will allow us to hopefully have enough to distribute to our members um, both a little fresh garlic in the spring and then more of the cured garlic in the fall. We'll sell some of that garlic uh, to other farms for seed garlic in the fall. That's what we're doing right now. And then it'll be enough to provide us with next year's seed. So if all goes well, we won't have to buy in any seed. We're growing our own seed. Uh, but that is a tricky thing is to figure out how much you need to plant. We actually overdid it a little last year. It was hard to get it all out of the ground and, um, you know, we didn't have much more room to cure it. So, um, yeah, but for our farm, um, which is about 500 families in our CSA, we, we will plant about 300 pounds of seed. So you saw us hanging in that video. We hang the garlic or we cure it on pallets. And um, really, it's there for eight to 10 weeks, uh, just hanging out, <laughs> literally. Yeah, refrigerate, yeah. Smelling good, looking festive. Um, and then uh, we clip the garlic, usually September. So we'll clip it off the stock, and it's nice and cured. And um, then you can really store it. We just put it in bushel boxes. You know, we sort it into, you want to keep your nicest, best garlic for seed um, because you want to keep improving your seed stock. Um, although some diversity in your seed stock is healthy, just good looking, even if it's not huge, nice looking cloves or nice looking bulbs. Um, but then we just store it in bushel boxes in a barn um, until we plant. We're going to plant. We're getting the field ready now, so we'll plant in about two weeks. Did I say bad garlic? <laughs> the, the, uh, oh, yeah. Out the bad <laughs> Sometimes when you're harvest, you just find bulbs that are 
they don't look good. They're somewhat rotten. Um, you know, sometimes a little bit of rot, it's fine because once, after you cure it, you know, you're going through and you're inspecting all the garlic and sorting it. So, um, you know, you have an opportunity to weed through the garlic again. But if you pull some right off the bat and they look funky or just rotten, usually we don't bother keeping them. We just put them aside um, and, you know, usually just burn them or... I should say, in 2011, I don't know how much we should talk about it, but <laughs> we had um, a really bad episode of white rot, and it pretty much ruined our garlic crop. And all of this garlic that we had saved previous to that, I had to get rid of. White rot, uh, sclerotia infestans, right? Super serious um, garlic disease, and um, we haven't had it since, but um, it's it sort of made me try to be extra careful with the garlic that we keep and the garlic that we plant. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that more. Um, hopefully that was a one-off and we'll never have white rot again. Yeah. Somerset County is interested in um, finding out information about other local sources for garlic. Uh, there's not a, not a huge garlic seed industry within New Jersey. Uh, there are some in, in New England, so they're not too far away. Um, I think uh, outfits like Johnny's, I think they sell garlic seeds and Seed Savers, I believe, uh, sells s small quantities. Um, you don't need a whole lot to get started and, uh, and you can, uh, you know, grow your own crop and, and, and really that's, that's really the, the, the way to get started. Also, you can get uh, planting stock on, on the internet, and there could be local sources that I'm just not aware of. If you look on the internet and uh, new, new people are popping up all the time, so th that's, that's a distinct possibility and a good use of the internet. I don't know, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, we, um, so I, high mowing sells organically certified garlic, and um, just to give you an idea, they sell a lot of their garlic for $24 a pound, which is astounding. So there might be a market for people to sell. We sell some, as I said, um, to uh, local farms in the region um, when we have extra. Um, and there is more affordable garlic. Um, there is a farm up in New York State called Cayuga, uh, Cayuga with a C. And um, um, when we had to replenish our stock, I got a bunch of garlic from them. It was uh, more reasonably priced. And, um, yeah, but I'm not sure of other Jersey sources that are selling it. It's, it's a good idea to buy it from a, a cert, your, your starting stock from a certified source uh, due to disease considerations. Uh, if, if you just go to a, a market or, you know, some place that you're not sure of, of the, the quality of the material, you could be introducing diseases into your field. Yeah, so, yeah, so we'll, we try to fallow all of our fields every fifth or sixth year, just as a general practice. So we put it, we take it out of crop production, no matter what we're growing, um, put it in a nice, thick, clovery-based um, fallow, and then, you know, so we won't till that soil for 18 to 20 months. We'll get all the organic matter, we'll get all that free nitrogen that the legumes give you. Um, so, and also garlic and all the other crops we grow, we try to do a five-year rotation. So we won't plant anything in the onion family where we had garlic for five years. Um, so yeah, and like I said, you don't have to fallow a field after garlic. We just find that it works well. Um, garlic's a heavy feeder and we've incorporated all that straw. So it just something that, you know, it's a pattern that's been successful for us. Also, white, uh, white rot that, that you've experienced is, is known to uh, overwinter and, and can, uh, can remain in the soil. The spores can remain in the soil for many seasons. So 
you know, rotation is, is important. I'm, I'm not sure if you went back in the field where you <laughs> white rot was, but. We lovingly yeah. call it the field of death. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Probably never went back. We haven't, we actually, the field where we had white rot, we haven't even tilled it since then. We've it's just been mowing it because the host apparently can survive for up to 30 years, or the, I'm sorry, the organism, well, organism can survive for 30 years without a host in the soil. And even if you're not planting something in the garlic or the onion family in that field, as you're putting equipment through the soil, your plows, your tractors, you're potentially moving that organism around your farm. Um, so <laughs> we haven't done anything with it. Um, we probably won't for a while. So. It's a severe case of rotation. Yeah, yeah, 30 year rotation. So the question is using plastic mulch um, in comparison to other mulches. I don't have a lot of experience. We don't use a lot of plastic on our farm. We use some, um, but I, I, I don't, and the farmers where I used to work before Fernbrook, we didn't use plastic mulch for garlic either. So I, I don't know, I don't have much experience with it. Um, well, obviously there's the, the cost of it. There's the application of it. There's the disposal of, a, of it uh, are the main issues. Right. Uh, it's difficult to, to dispose of agricultural plastics. Uh, they're not, as a rule, uh, recyclable. Uh, they have to be handled separately. Uh, frequently, there are pathogens on them that have to be dealt with. Um, so that's a disadvantage. Uh, of, of, and, and of course, most of them are, are hydrocarbon based. So if you want to have an operation that you're trying to foster your soil, uh, you know, the, you might not want to have the plastic uh, on your on your farm for this purpose. Uh, there are some advantages to, to using uh, plastic mulches. There's evidence, for example, that um, onion thrips are, are uh, repelled by certain colors of plastic, right. things like me uh, metallicized plastic. So by using metallicized plastic mulch, uh, you can perhaps repel some of these pests. We're not sure about leaf miner, but um, I think there's some evidence that, uh, that thrips are repelled by, by silverized mulch. Yeah, one thought on plastic is that garlic, it's such a long season, and it's um, obviously over winter that, um, you know, every, every time you get holes in the plastic, you're probably going to get weeds in that hole. So it's a long time to have a successful plastic layer. That might be something to consider. Um, but again, I don't really, I've never done it, so. You know, the plastic doesn't introduce any weed problem. For, potentially, if you buy straw, uh, you, can, you can introduce weeds. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the, the moisture uh, and the uh, thermal uh, retention properties of, of plastic versus uh, the straw. I think uh, overall, the, the, the straw uh, is desirable because at the end of the season, you've got a, a soil amendment that you can, you can put right back in into the soil, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a benefit at the end of the season. That Whereas with the plastic, you've, you've got a liability. You have to remove the plastic and dispose of it. So we have a question from Kate May about um, pricing. So I think this is for you, Ian, about um, how do you establish garlic prices and does it vary by variety? Uh, the question was how do you establish garlic prices? Um, I don't really establish them. Um, I just sort of choose, um, getting back to the video and how I choose um, certain purveyors for things, um, quite often it, it isn't the cheapest, it isn't the, um, the most expensive, it's really um, the person that's most knowledgeable about their product. Somebody that can tell me a story about their product, um, somebody that's passionate about um, uh, garlic, uh, per se, in speaking about this, um, you know, this, this forum. Um, so it, it isn't always about um, the cheapest or the most expensive. It really boils down to, um, you know, somebody that's really passionate and really, um, you know, has a lot to, to tell about his or her product. Go 
from farm direct to consumer uh, other than a CSA or, or farmer's market? So I guess go straight to a restaurant. So the question is how easy is it to go f right from your farm uh, to market your garlic? Um, if you don't have a CSA, are there other good marketing opportunities? Um, do you want to say how, do you, are you buying a lot of garlic right now, Ian? Um, for, through Rutgers uh, Dining Services, um, we, you know, on a general uh, basis, we purchase, um, you know, peeled garlic um, for, you know, uh, which is, a, you know, a Chinese product that's used um, division-wide. Um, but if we're looking for niche garlic and things like that for things like at Harvest, where we're, we're more focused upon um, rewarding better agricultural practices um, and menus that, that feature um, different types of garlic. Uh, you know, we, we use um, some black garlic where we ferment it. Um, we also use pickled garlic um, we use scapes um, in the early part of the summer with, you know, sautéed and grilled and, you know, things like that. So we can't use the peeled garlic for that, um, that the larger division uses. But um, there's, there's definite, um, you know, areas where we procure certain, you know, niche uh, market garlic. Um, it ha definitely has a use and it's definitely, um, you know, in a, in a previous life before I was with Rutgers, um, in high-end restaurants, um, there's a market for it. And if you show up at a back door um, with your product and you know, you're knowledgeable about your product and you're passionate about it, um, and you speak to chefs that are really passionate about what they do, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna find a market um, and you'll push somebody else out um, or you'll create your own markets. So it's really important um, to continue to have that passion and knock on a door and keep knocking on that door until, you know, you get, you know, the forum and the, and the relationship. You develop trust with somebody. Um, and um, that's what works. Uh, because believe me, chefs that are passionate about what they do don't like broadliners and don't like to buy things that are commercialized. They like things that are, you know, unique. Things that, that offer them an edge over another chef. Um, things that don't have a very big carbon footprint that are local, that are, um, that are about, um, you know, really, you know, telling a story of, you know, your farm, you know, because you're not just growing garlic, you're growing, you know, Bob's garlic, you know, and why is that special, you know, and that's going to go on a menu, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, you know, local salmon with, you know, Bob's garlic scapes, you know, or Bob's farms garlic scapes. So it's, it's, um, you know, it's important, it's important, important facet to that. And, um, a lot of small farms in northern New Jersey, where I live in Hunterdon County, um, do this, and they're they're quite successful at gathering certain you know chefs. Um, you know, if that's 10, 15 different restaurants, you know, that's um, you know a couple of pounds a week, you know, in each one. So, yeah, I also think um, I wonder how big the market could be for growing garlic for seed garlic. You know, it seems it's Maybe a little bit untapped, and I think uh, Tom was right about if you can get your seed uh, tested and you know, certified, um, that could be quite profitable. It's nice too because garlic, it, once it's cured, you've got some wiggle room. You know, you can sell some now, you can hold on to some, you could bring it to winter markets. Um, the garlic scapes, it seems like all the growers, obviously, everyone's got scapes at the same time. So we've sold garlic scapes to restaurants and stuff, but sometimes. There's a glut. But again, the garlic, you can do it fresh in the summer or you can cure it and then you've got a pretty big window for figuring out how you're going to market that garlic. So I would say yes. The Somerset has a question about um, how, the, how the bulb responds once it's planted in the fall. What's the plant's behavior in the fall? What happens during the winter months and then in the springtime? I was like, question for you, big guy. <laughs> well, you're the one that, 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 that watches it all winter long. I, I'm, I'm in the greenhouse then. Um, if you could repeat the question, Tom, I'd appreciate All right, the, the question is, well, how does the, once the garlic cloves are planted in the fall, uh, how do they respond? What's the, sort of like the, their behavior uh, until they start to regrow in the spring, I believe, is the question. 
uh, well, they will, uh, you, you plant uh, the, the garlic, you know, in, in the field, uh, you know, according to the, the, the density and pattern that, that Jeff had, had outlined in the video, uh, and make sure that the pointy end is up because that's the, that's the shoot and the basal plate is down and it'll, it'll almost immediately sprout both ends of the, of the uh, clove will sprout. It'll start to grow a root system. And the root system is really the most important thing because the root system needs to get well established before uh, frost, the, the, the ground begins to freeze and, and uh, the surface of the soil begins to, begins to frost over and die. So uh, that root system for, for the plant to be able to adequately overwinter needs to be well established. And that's the reason to pick the time uh, correctly uh, you know, at the, in the fall to, uh, you don't want to go too early or too late. Um, so as, as uh, frost sets in, the tops of the plants uh, go dormant. And uh, if you mulch properly, you don't see very much. It's just sort of the field sits there with the mulch until uh, everything starts to warm back up in the spring. And, uh, and suddenly one day you'll look out the, the window and you see a lot of green sprouts coming through the mulch. And, uh, and the regrowth uh, happens fairly early. Uh, in, in my experience, uh, depending on variety and where you are, uh, they'll start regrowing if, if you've got a, a fairly mild winter, even in February and, and early March, and you can start to see uh, you know, sprouts by uh, you know, mid-March or, or late March uh, start to come through the mulch. I don't know if that's the experience you've, you've had. Yeah. Um, I I hate warm winters for a lot of reasons, and um, one reason is the garlic can just puts on too much growth too soon, and you know then it can be susceptible to damage if you know puts on a lot of top growth and then um, you get a real bad cold snap. Um, so it's one reason we try not to plant our garlic too early because you don't know what the weather is going to be, but um, you know these days it seems it's been warmer longer, so. My first year, um, we planted our garlic Thanksgiving weekend because I was working in New England. But we came, we wanted to establish our garlic in New Jersey, so we, uh, after Thanksgiving dinner, we all popped the garlic and then we planted it the next day. And we had a nice crop, um, so you can wait, as long as the ground's not frozen. But I think you want to hit that sweet spot where it starts to grow and you can put it to bed with the mulch. Oh, I wanted to add, we wait until it's cold, the soil is relatively cold before we mulch because it's almost like you want to trap in the cold. You want to kind of let it, the garlic go dormant. Um, so we'll often plant our garlic and then come back and mulch it a couple weeks later. Um, you know, you, you, you don't have to mulch it right away. I think it's better if you wait for the ground to get a little bit cold. Let the heat go out of it. Let the heat go out of it, yep. So. And to piggyback on that, um, about how much straw do you need per acre for mulch? Great question. And cost? I think we used, um, so again, our field that you saw in the video was about 0.45 acres. And I put down, we used uh, about $750 a straw with 750 divided by five. Yeah, I'd say we probably used 100 and 120 bales, square bales total for that field. but. Probably half of that was, well, probably two-thirds of that was used in the fall, um, in November for mulching. And then when we come back into our second um, layer in April, it's probably not quite as much straw. So I think probably for, so I'd say for a half-acre field, it would be about 125 bales total, more or less. Yeah. And we actually try to go a little thicker. Um, you know, we've got the three rows of garlic and then there's about 18 inches before the next bed and we try to go pretty thick in between there because you can be a little thicker with the mulch. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, suffocating any garlic, so. But you do want to get rid of the weeds. Yeah, right, so you can go thicker in between the beds so you definitely um, have better weed suppression. Okay, great, thank you. So we are scheduled for a, a short break, so we encourage everybody to network during this time, eat more food, um, and we need to be back in our seats by 10 after so we can get started with the SWOT analysis with Robin. 
And um, we encourage those of you at this live site to write down questions um, for the next round that we have with the panel so we can make sure all the sites are, are hearing what's going on. Okay, thank you. So a quest first question is, um, would you recommend growing soft neck types in New Jersey? You tried them? I, I, it's funny, just in preparing for like this panel, I've been looking more into soft necks. And I've never grown them, but um, I'm intrigued. But I don't really have any experience. So um, you can grow them in Jersey. Well, I think the, the, the diver more of the culinary diversity, I think, is, is in the hard necks. Uh, I think the soft neck types uh, are, the, the, the genetic base of them is rel relatively narrow. Uh, there's, there's a few varieties, they all pretty much look the same. There probably is some diversity there, but uh, all the diversity I've seen in hard necks is, is much broader. You see a lot of different colors, a lot of different shapes, a lot of different flavors. Uh, and so from the standpoint of, of somebody getting into an ultra niche market that's going to be lucrative, um, the soft necks is what they sell at the mass marketing, the, the supermarkets. And uh, you know, sure, you can braid them and, and make a nice braid and make a wreath out of garlic, but you know that uh, I think has somewhat limited appeal. I think the probably the bigger opportunity is the, the culinary, maybe some health, perhaps you know some other uh, appearance. Uh, but you know, finding a, a niche niche somewhere in that realm, I think, is probably the best best opportunity. So I think for the smaller grower, I think the, the bigger opportunity is the hard necks. And from the, the buyer's perspective? Uh, yeah, certainly. I mean, the hard neck um, uh, varieties are, they offer, uh, you know, a, a, a plethora of different, you know, hot and spicy to things that just don't even taste like garlic. You know, they, they taste more like a, a butter or a different vegetable completely. Um, I love, you know, tasting different, um, you know, different garlics. Uh, and, and from year to year, I mean, you find that your garlic uh, probably tastes different from um, year to year, right? Uh, fluctuates in a little bit intensity and stuff. A little bit sometimes. I mean, yeah, there's some hard necks that we've grown that have been spicier, and uh, but um, maybe the yield isn't, you know, so good. So if if the yield is poor, it in the different applications with hard necks, you, you can certainly, you know, there's, uh, you know, like I said, we pickle it. We, you know, we do a lot of different things with garlic. So there's, you know, there's garlic that I use for marinades, there's garlic that I use for um, fresh uh, dips and things like that. There's, you know, different different types of garlic um, and different types of applications. So probably, a, you know, go ahead. A little intrigued with the, uh, Jeff's comment about the, uh, the fresh garlic. You know, since we're, we're so close to all these urban centers, maybe that's something that, that we could, that New Jersey could capitalize on is, is marketing fresh garlic as opposed to cured mm -hmm. garlic. Because uh, there, there are d distinct flavor differences. And, uh, yeah, very and pungent. Very pungent when it's fresh, yeah. There have been uh, several questions about the actual planting of garlic, so depth, um, so like the tips on on proper planting of garlic. Yeah, so uh, this is the time of year. The question was about tips on proper planting and the depths and specifications, right? Things like that. So we're preparing our garlic field right now. Well, maybe not right now, but these, these couple weeks. We've been spreading compost, um, disking up the field, and um, we'll probably aim to plant around Halloween. Um, and so our last, on our farm, we use a, an implement called a spader as our last pass. It looks kind of like a giant rototiller, but it, it has a better action for soil tilth. And um, we spade the field. And so um, when you're working the ground, it's, it's pretty soft. It's nice, um, easy to work. And we have just a device that, it's a field marker, so it creates dibbles or holes in the uh, field at the, increments that we want to plant. So we spade the field, well, we'll put down the compost and the fertilizer, then we spade, and then we'll use our dibbler or our row marker. And then, um, this is one thing we haven't talked about. It's good to, here's the garlic. Um, we keep it in the bulb right until, as soon as um, we're about to plant. We don't pop the garlic until a few days before we plant. 
it just keeps better in here. It's not prone to drying out or getting some sort of, um, you know, contamination. So um, we'll, before we plant, we'll sit down, we'll have a big garlic popping uh, party. And um, then we go, people have buckets of the loose garlic and they walk and they drop the garlic at the correct spaces. They just drop, 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 drop. And then we have, we literally crawl on the ground like babies <laughs> and plant the garlic um, with, the, like you said, the basil plate down and the point up. And we plant it about, we put about an inch of soil um, over the top of the clove. Um, so, you know, you, you press it firmly, um, cover it with about an inch of soil, and then you move on. You can get going pretty fast. Um, if the soil conditions are good, the ground is soft, um, the tractors made these nice dibbles, basically people are dropping and other people are coming up behind and just pressing it in and it go pretty quick. The other nice thing is you don't have to get it all done in one day. Um, you know, like with other plantings throughout the season, the windows of opportunity come quickly. You have to get planted, you've got to move on. Garlic, you can take a little more time. You can plant some of it, you know, you can spread it out over a course of 10 days, two weeks, something like that, as long as you don't get serious rain events or hard frosts or something like that that would get in your way. But, um, you know, you can, you don't have to get it all done at once. So. And again, every six inches in the row, we plant it three rows, and the rows are 12 inches apart, and then three rows to a bed. A question about deer, and do they have a preference for garlic? Um, <laughs> they've never messed with our garlic. <laughs> That's one, actually, you know what? Going back to the sheets that we made for New Jersey, where there's a lot of deer problems, I've yet to meet a deer that has eaten garlic. Is that just because he's eating something else? Yeah, they're eating our cabbage and our spinach and our broccoli. No, uh, they don't really, the onion family in general, mm -hmm. deer don't seem to be. I think, well, I think they have a low, real low preference for the, the sulfur compounds. In general, as a matter of fact, what they don't go after daffodils either, I think, uh, mm. members of the, uh, the lily family. Mm. So I, I, I don't think deer is a big problem. Yeah, and deer repellents garlic. have garlic in them, so yeah, yeah that's, that's, a, that's a real plus. Um, there's a question from Somerset um, for Ian about what varieties of garlic <coughs> do you use for particular uh, recipes or, or dishes? Uh, hard neck German um, we use uh, a lot. Um, for uh, you know heat and um, as a uh, synergy with ginger and things like that um, in Thai and, and, and spicy uh, stir fries uh, that we uh, use at harvest um, uh, we use um, you know larger uh, more bulbous um, garlic for uh, the dehydration uh, black garlic that takes about 10 days um, I can't remember the, uh, the species or the, the, the name of that uh, offhand. Um, but, you know, generally we, we uh, look for that story um, from certain farms, uh, you know, that, w that we try to procure from is that somebody that has a, you know, a variety that they're passionate about um, and that they grow and, and that we're happy to put on our menu uh, because it is a local farm or it's, you know, supporting local agriculture. So that's really important for, for harvest. Um, Jeff, there's a question um, about compost and um, are you composting yourself? What do you look for in a compost that you would be using uh, in a field that you're going to be growing garlic in? A question about compost that we use uh, for garlic. Yeah, for the compost, we don't make specific compost for our garlic. We just make compost that we spread on all of our fields. Um, and it's, it's leaf-based. We get township leaves. We also get, uh, we use horse manure and bedding um, and vegetable scraps and, you know, the other materials that you compost. But it's leaf-based um, and it's well-aged, I'd say, you know, it's probably 18 months old by the time we're spreading it. Um, before the garlic um, and turned numerous times um, and um, 
you know, well, well decomposed. Um, but that's, you know, you sort of know when the compost is generally done cooking and um, it's got that beautiful smell and it's not steamy anymore. Um, farmer I used to work for said, good compost has dead, very dead, and very, very dead material in it. So, you know, some things you can recognize as a piece of leaf and stick and other things, it's just so decomposed, it's just that humus, um, so. And Kate May had two questions about producing garlic seeds. So they were curious about the seed yield per plant, and then how would you harvest the seed from the plant? Uh, the garlic is the seed. I'm sorry, so a question about seed harvest and seed production for garlic. Um, I, I, I guess you can propagate garlic from the scape, but it takes many years to, um, yeah. to develop garlic that's of size. I mean... They, they don't produce uh, true, true seeds. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the planting material is, is asexual. It's the, uh, it's the, the cloves that, that come from the bulbs. Uh, you can use bulb bills, uh, they will germinate uh, from the flowers, but uh, it, it takes a lot longer. Yeah, so the yield would be, I mean, usually, you know, so this, I was just, this has seven, uh, this bulb has seven cloves in it, so if you're going to plant this, you're going to get seven cloves, and then each clove will make a bulb. So, you know, your yields are generally six to one, I guess, is the rule of thumb. It could be more than that, um, and if you grow big garlic, it's going to weigh more, you know, um, than the stuff you planted. But, um, you know, if you just save, if you start with 10 pounds and you save all your garlic for seed, you know, you might be planting 60 or 70 pounds, and then if you save it again, so within a couple of years, you know, you don't have to start off with a lot, but if you just keep saving it and planting that, um, you're going to grow your, your stock pretty quickly. Okay. There's a question, um, and you talked about having the white rot, the sclerotinia issue in the field, um, and um, is there a cure for that? <laughs> How do you think it got there? Yeah. Question about white rot. Um, somebody play some dark sounding music while I tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> I've been festing sclerotia. It was a dark night. Well, I don't know how it got there. Um, we had a lot of the seed, we, this was 2011, we had been growing garlic for, I guess, five years. And a lot of the, most of the garlic we were planting was our own. I did buy in some garlic from another farm in New York, but he had, he had never had white rot and he had his tested. It's possible some came in on that, but there was a few other farms in the region that year that developed white rot. And I do know that the winter was very warm because we had top growth very early on. I don't know if that contributed to it, but um, also, I had used a previous source of straw, and it was, it was a mistake. It was not very high quality, but it's, white rot is not supposed to, it's supposed to be uh, seed borne only, so it's not supposed to just travel on the wind. I, I don't know how we got it, um, but there's no cure, um, even if you use conventional. I mean, some farmers, they've tried drastic things like um, so, uh, flooding fields to try to wash the actual organism out of the soil. Um, but there's really, I looked into even um, chemical conventional applications and there's, there's no cure that we know of for white rot. Um, there was a farm in somewhere in New England, they developed white rot and they ended up paving that field and building greenhouses. <laughs> because again, you can transfer that around your farm even if you're not growing something in the onion family in that field. So, um, you know, that's the one that keeps the California growers up at night. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a mystery to us of how it landed on our farm. Um, at some point I thought we might be done growing garlic forever. It, you know, it took us a couple years to get back up to production. And, you know, this was the best year we've ever had. So I'm really glad. But again, that little field, luckily it wasn't a huge field, but we've, we've not gone back into it. We've just been mowing it. So. Um, we only have um, 24 years left, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep, keep it. Keep it mowed. It's a great fallow. Right. But, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a scary thing. And I, I really didn't know much about it until we started pulling. The garlic tops looked great that spring. 
Um, they looked really good. I was super excited, and then we started pulling them, and it was black, sticky, and we started finding that more and more, and our extension agent, Ray Samuels, came out, and he looked at it, and, oh. Hmm. <laughs> 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 it was interesting, and uh, we had it tested at the Rutgers lab, and, and sure enough, so, uh, yeah, we basically had no garlic that year. We had to destroy it. By and large, if, if, you, can, if you see symptoms of a disease, it, it's really kind of too late. Uh, particularly with something like garlic. You're going to see it in the spring. Uh, you're, you're not going to have that much time to defeat it. Uh, and, and really most of the, the fungicides uh, are topical. They'll just slow it down. And, uh, and so it's the, the best way to approach diseases is prevention and sanitation. So sanitizing your operation as much as possible, rotation, ro rotating as much as possible. <coughs> and your planting material is important too. It has to be clean. And one way to, to ensure that with diseases, you can heat treat the, uh, the material. Uh, a lot of people don't do it and, and get away with it. Maybe well, I could talk Jeff into trying it. We do some future. seeds we heat treat, but I've never done garlic. garlic. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar thing. I think yeah. uh, you can heat up to uh, either 130 or 140 Fahrenheit for a period of 10 to, to 20 minutes. Hmm. Uh, and it will eradicate most uh, of these pathogens. And it doesn't uh, have a, a, a terribly bad uh, adverse effect on the, mm. the viability of the cloves. So, um, so that's. Repeat the question. Repeat the, the treatment? Repeat the question. Do, do you set, she asked if you separate, for the heat treatment? Oh. If you separate the uh, bulbs and the cloves before the heat treatment. Well, what you would do is, as Jeff does in his operation, you, you go, through your harvest and, and select the bulbs that you want to use for the, the for the planting the seed, planting next year's crop, and then use those bulbs to uh, to take the bulb bills, remove the bulb bills from the bulbs before you're going to plant them, and then subject them to the heat treatment, <coughs> dry them off after the heat treatment for a short period of time, and then plant them. How do you heat treat it? In you can use. Uh, uh, how, a do water, you, how do you heat treat how do you heat the, how do you heat treat the, the, the cloves? Well, typically you have to have some kind of a, of a controlled. You can probably do it even on a on a large stove with a big, you know, Dutch oven or something. Most uh, in a in a laboratory, it would be done with a with a water bath, where you can control the temperature. But you can do it in your own kitchen. It's not you know, between 130 and 140. You get a you know a, an oven thermometer and just uh, hold it there uh, for 10 to 20 minutes and just make sure that the cloves are, reach that temperature. I'm not even sure if they need to be absolutely submerged. They just need to be heated. Hmm. Interesting. Um, can I follow up? I didn't mention, we, do a, we dip our seed garlic in a um, product called T22, um, which is an organic fungicide. Um, so it, that's a biological that colonizes on the garlic. So we, we dip our we, we pop the garlic and then the cloves, we soak them for a couple minutes, pull them out, and then we plant them. So that is one, we talk about preventative, mm -hmm. yeah. seemed to have helped. Uh, pound, uh, pound of cure. Questions? Mm -hmm. Another yeah. question? Uh, we have uh, uh, access to the Rutgers Lab and question was about using seaweed and you said eelgrass, eelgrass. Uh, in regards to using that as a possible mulch for, for garlic. Um, I have none of any experience with it, but if it's, yeah, I, I couldn't really say too much. We use a fish kelp spray foliar feed in the spring, it's, you know, but I've never used that as mulch. I don't, we don't have much experience. Yeah, I mean, we, we'd, we'd have to test it. I, that, what I would recommend is maybe uh, for a year or so, testing it, you know, alongside a, a conventional product like, like straw or leaves or something, just to make sure that, you know, you know it's, uh, it, it can be used and it doesn't have any kind of deleterious effect. Okay, we've got another question for Ian. Um, is there a garlic that you'd love to buy locally that you can't find locally? Um, 
I, I, I really enjoy, um, you know, uh, finding, uh, you know, I, I, I search uh, farmers markets for interesting little, you know, uh, nuggets, uh, you know, um, I try to, you know, approach CSAs in PA and in Bucks County and, and where I'm at and, and find, um, you know, new varieties. Um, you know, there's not one particular one that I use uh, for, you know, that, that I find that I love for just as a general garlic. I just like to use, I like to find, um, you know, interesting aspects about every sort of piece of garlic for, and then find applications for it, whether it be raw in dips or whether it be hot and spicy in marinades um, or um, using it for, for roasting, you know, uh, to get a sweeter quality. Uh, in the garlic, so there's not one particular particular variety, but um, as you know, Jeff has mentioned with respect to hard neck varieties, um, I think you find the most, um, you know, the most variety in application um, for you know a niche market as a grower um, and as a chef. That's what I appreciate the most. So. And I'm sure you see other chefs out scouting the markets as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that wraps up our, our panel for questions. Thank you all so much for, for being here and, and answering those <coughs> questions. Um, and I, I hope we were able to answer um, as many of the questions as, as we could. If we didn't answer questions, feel free to write them down and we can try to pin Jeff down to give us more answers as, as well as uh, Tom something we've been able to do in the past for, for participants. But again, um, everybody should feel free to reach out to the Ultra Niche Crops team if you have questions later on. We're more than happy to, to help find answers for you, um, especially as you get into a growing season and are testing something out. Okay, so we're gonna move on. It's now time to focus on the survey. Um, for those of you that have participated with this before, this is the same survey that you've completed. Um, this survey is confidential, so while you do put your name on the survey, um, we, we handle the results in a way that the, the data is, is kept confidential to you, and um, so there's no risk in giving us your true opinions. Um, so um, this, this survey, you can see there's the first page, it's two pages of a lot of information um, telling you exactly what, uh, what we're going to do with the results of this survey um, and how we're handling this information um, and how we're making sure that it is kept confidential. Um, we ask that you fill out the, the questions and so we want to know if you're currently growing this crop. Um, and if you're not currently growing this crop, do you plan to, to start growing this crop based on what you learned tonight? Question number two, I wanna draw your attention um, to the question because you need to first indicate um, your knowledge after attending the session. We sometimes have people that, that think that this is going in chronological order. Um, so please indicate first what, um, what your knowledge is after, and then secondly, answer what your knowledge was about growing garlic after or before attending the session. Um, on the back side, there are questions about uh, whether you plan to attend a, a future Ultra Niche Crops program, if, especially if this is your first time. Um, will you view the online virtual trip? So that's the video that we have, um, which is available online, um, as well as the business management videos and the crop profiles and budgets. So um, once you've once we're done with all of this, all of this information will be uploaded on our Ultra Niche Crops website. So you'll have access to the videos and the handouts and, and additional resources after the fact. Um, and then we ask you to rate the, um, your impressions about the session in the following. To the left is extremely bad. To the right is extremely good. Um, and then we have two specific questions about you and your farm. So how long have you been farming? Um, and then give, you can give some specific information about yourself. You can answer as many of those questions as you'd like, um, but answering them is very helpful to the team. As we move forward, we are now officially halfway done with our Ultra Niche Crops program. We have five more um, scheduled to focus on other crops. And we hope that you'll join us in the future for those. Thank you.